Scott will have the lesson this morning and this afternoon. And then the Lord's Supper will be led by Lance and assisted by Blake and Layton. Um, we have some more announcements that we'll go ahead and save for the, the end of the service. Uh, but we'll go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful Lord's Day. We thank you for this day of um, remembrance and celebration of our sins being forgiven by uh, your son being nailed to the cross. We ask that you keep that in our hearts and our minds as we go through this lesson. Use it to motivate us to sing your praises and to study your word and to memorize it and keep your, keep your will. Uh, keep us safe throughout the service. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Should be 528, not 529. 528. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives and never prays, and never prays for me. I know, I know eternal life. Sin and sorrow free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life He gives. I know as my Redeemer lives, my Redeemer lives. He wills, he wills that I should hold.
Like him, like him, we rise. 
479. 479. This song before reading in prayer. <coughs> comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 1 through 10. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling, and my speech and now preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Whoever we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not in the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we approach your throne of mercy and grace and love this morning, thanking you for this Lord's Day that you've made for us and the opportunity we have to come to your house to worship you today and to remember your Son. As the world celebrates uh, your resurrection of your Son, we pray that uh, we will uh, remember that every, each and every day that we live here on this earth and especially to celebrate it on each Lord's Day. We thank you for the opportunity to be here, the health and strength that we have to uh, be able to worship you in spirit and in truth and to sing praises to you and to remember your Son. We thank you for our homes, our families, all the great blessings that you bless us with. We thank you for the promises you make through your word that uh, if we are obedient to, the, to you that we can spend eternity with you in the great after a while. We th thank you for this country in which we live and the freedoms that we enjoy and 
And we pray that we'll have these freedoms that we have to, especially to meet and worship you without fear until Christ returns again to deliver the kingdom to you, O God. We thank you for the love that you have for us, that you sent your Son to die on that cross and to be resurrected again the third day. We thank you for this hope that we have in that great day when the graves will be opened and that we will meet you and spend eternity with you. We pray for uh, Scott this morning as he presents your word to us. Help us to remember the things that we hear and read and study from your word and then be doers of your word. We pray for this country in which we live and the troubles and the trials and the turmoil that's going on. We pray for our leadership that they might humble themselves before you, O God, and understand that they have a supreme being that they must answer to, that they will humble themselves and look to you for guidance, look to, look to you in your word for guidance as they rule. We pray for those that protect us, our policemen, our firemen, our paramedics, the first responders, the military that uh, we have that uh, would lay down their life to pr protect our freedoms. And Lord, oh God, we beg you to stop the slaughter that's going on in Ukraine, that uh, those people might have peace, that uh, they might... Uh, know your word and the enemies Lord they pray that they might uh, be able to know your word also and, and, and stop these atrocities we thank you O oh God for the rich things that you give us and we bless ask your blessings on each one here this morning that we have come to worship you in spirit and in truth and to remember the great sacrifice of your son that the Lord the God, Lord God you love the world so much that you sent your son here to die. We can't hardly imagine that kind of love, but we thank you so much for it. Bless us as we go through this service, and then uh, uh, when you're through with us here on this earth, we might have a peaceful hour in which to meet you and then live with you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <coughs> I've learned in life that sometimes we make mistakes. <laughs> um, Scott, where is it that it says, he who stands, take heed lest he fall? <laughs> so um, I thought I knew what number those songs were. I looked them up and said, oh yeah, that's it. And I was wrong. Invitation's actually going to be 420, <laughs> not... 969, so that will be the invitation, 420. Um, and here's the thing, even though all of y'all will make fun of me, and some of you, Scott, will say, I told you so, it doesn't matter how many times I mess up and y'all make fun of me, it doesn't matter because I know God will forgive me for it. <laughs> See, 989. 989. Nope, 980, huh? 989. Oh. <laughs> I did get that one right. People will try to tell you what to do, but you know. And we're going to sing it like it is in the book. 989. Is that right? That's not right. See? Soon and very soon we are going to see the kingdom. Soon and very soon we are going to see the kingdom. Soon and very soon we are going to see the king. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the king. No more crying there. We are going to see the King. Hallelujah. No more crying there. We 
are going to see the King. Hallelujah. No more crying there. We are going to see the King. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to see the King. No more dying there. We are going to see the King. No more dying there. We are going to see the King. No more dying there. We are going to see the King. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to see the King. 420 will be the song of the day. This thing on. <laughs> no, I'm just thinking if uh, if Brian and I keep making mess ups, we might be seeing the king sooner than we thought we would. <laughs> Michelle, can I have my screen, please? And if you keep messing up back there, I know I'll get Brian to deal with you <laughs> later. This morning we're going to mainly focus on two of the verses from the reading today, verses 8 and verse 9, which verse 8 talks about the fact that the rulers that crucified the Lord did not understand. They didn't know who He was. And then in verse 9 He talks about the fact that we can't even begin to comprehend what God has prepared for those that love Him. Uh, many of you know the late uh, N.E. Rhodes, Jr., uh, Ne was a mentor of mine and someone that I thought a lot of. He was from Nashville. He was a graduate of Vanderbilt University. He was an eloquent preacher and writer, and he was a character in addition to all that. Uh, some of my memories, one of my first memories of Ne is when I was in the ninth grade playing quarterback for the Kimmons Raiders, and we were playing the Ramsey Rams across town rival. And N.E. had come to hold a weekend meeting in Fort Smith. And so, you know, junior highs played on Thursday night. He came early to watch my game because N.E. was a big Dallas Cowboy fan. And uh, so he came to watch the game. And I, I can just remember uh, after that game, him critiquing everything and going over the game. And I could talk, you know, I could talk football with N.E. And, and many other things. He was a big fan, of course, of C.S. Lewis and his writings. And he had a kind of a photographic memory. He could read something and just about quote it right back to you verbatim, just the way it was. And some of the images I have of him are not so eloquent. I remember he came through Oklahoma City when I was there going to college, spent the night with us. I remember getting up that next morning and seeing him humped over the kitchen table with his hair all going all directions, and he was playing solitaire. That's what he liked to do a lot. He was all ready for breakfast. But anyway, I bring up N.E. because he was a great writer, and I want to use one of his articles that he wrote years ago in the Gospel Tidings. He wrote a lot in, uh, in Gospel Tidings entitled, Who Crucified Our Lord? And then also this morning, I'm going to use C.S. Lewis a little bit one of his favorite authors. In uh, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 8, of course, it talks about the fact that if they had known, and we wonder, you know, how could they not have known who Jesus was? In 1 Corinthians 2 and 8, Paul says, For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Imagine the emotion vibrating in the heart of the great Apostle Paul when he says this. It is enough to make us all stop incredulous, rooted to the spot, staring at this strange and terrible truth. They have crucified the Lord of glory. How could they? What terrible insanity seized upon them? What horrible malformation of human nature sought or brought such a thing to pass. 
But who did it? What terrible monsters masquerading as men were guilty of this blackest crime in history? But what if they were not monsters at all? What if they were quite ordinary people? Men who went home that night to children, who climbed trustingly up in their laps. Men who told their wives as they supped how they had at last rid themselves and the country of that troublesome carpenter out of Galilee. What if they were people who lived their lives as respectable, ordinary, law-abiding citizens? People like you and me. When I think of this, I'm made to wonder if perhaps this is not, or there is not the sound of hammering in our lives too. Is there blood on our hands? It is then that I feel a shiver in my soul. Figuratively speaking, we too have crowded around the cross and laughed up in the face of the suffering Savior. We too have betrayed Him. Time and again, we have turned our backs upon the cross and gone away glad to be rid of this perplexing figure in our lives that would call us out of our own selfishness. No, I hear someone say, it isn't so. People like us had nothing to do with Christ's death. Certainly we never betrayed Him. It was the Pharisees who did it. Why? It is so. But who, pray tell, were the Pharisees? No facile answer will do here. This is an important question. The Pharisees were frank in their dislike of Christ. When he laid claim to divinity, they thought he was blaspheming. They considered his behavior shocking. A gluttonous man, an old bibber of wine. They judged the company that he kept to be disgusting. The friend of publicans and sinners. They found Christ far too unorthodox to fit their taste. He would not join hands with their little sect. They couldn't count on him always to fall in line with them. And so they counted him out. But who were they? They were morally upright men for the most part. They attended church regularly. They were strict about their religious duties. They were given to prayer, long prayers. With it all, however, they found in their hearts little or nothing of love. They had not one shred of mercy. They were completely legalistic. They had missed utterly the spirit of godliness in the cold, hard formalism of their dogma. They clapped their hands over their ears and closed their minds to what Jesus had to say. It sounded a little different from what their fathers had said. Any fresh light, even that drawn from their own scriptures, had to be wrong because it was not in accordance with the traditions of their fathers. I hear people today boasting of believing just like Mama and Daddy did. They boast that nothing has ever changed any of their religious opinions and nothing ever will. I hear them argue that the old-timers who wrote the creeds and case-hardened the prejudices are the only ones who knew anything, and they knew it all. They say that anyone who does not follow slavishly is dangerous. And when they say all this, I'm made to wonder. I wonder if the Pharisees couldn't have stood before the cross on Golgotha's hill and said the same thing. Isn't that the attitude that crucified Christ? Didn't he hang on the cross because he was considered a dangerous teacher? Because those who wanted to be the conscience of all the people couldn't count on him? But someone else arises and says, it was not the Pharisees who were primarily responsible. It was Caiaphas and Annas and the other rich and powerful Sadducees. They were the men. Yes, they were implicated. But who were the Sadducees? And we have a comparison of the Pharisees and the Sadducees here. 
The Pharisees, of course, were very strict about the law. The Sadducees actually controlled the temple and the worship services. The Pharisees, for the most part, were middle class. The Sadducees were upper class. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees did not. They believed in an afterlife, but no afterlife by the Pharisees. And, of course, the Pharisees rejected the Jewish leaders while the Sadducees supported the Jewish leaders. So just who were the Sadducees? The Sadducees were the modernists of their day. They denied both the existence of angel and spirit. They brushed aside time-honored concepts as the silly superstitions of untutored minds. They claimed to believe the Old Testament scriptures and paid lip service to the law. They professed faith in Jehovah and acted as dignitaries in religious services, yet they built God in their own image and interpreted His law to suit their own selfish philosophies. Men rise up today saying they are truly progressive and brush aside doctrines that have been precious to dedicated hearts for years. Without fair examination, they dub them old fogey notions. They call anyone who opposes their roughshod iconoclism a radical reactionary. They smile tolerantly at certain passages and say sagely, custom and tradition have changed since then. Such men need to remember that Jesus did not claim to be the custom. Jesus said, I am the truth. The truth has been the same for almost 20 centuries. Yes, the Sadducees had their part in the crucifixion of our Lord, and his modern counterpart still cripples, or cripples the cause of Christ today. But someone says, what a pilot. Did he not play a part in this grim drama? Yes, there was Pilot. Pilot, who stood halting between two opinions. Pilot wasn't really against Christ, but he didn't have the courage to be for him. Pilot despised the Jews while he feared them. Watch him snarl like a trapped beast. Watch him wash his hands in an attempted craven neutrality. Watch him then raise a cross. Yes, there are people like that today, too. But someone says, what of the ordinary folk? What of the people who were not governors or priests or religious leaders? What of the crowd of ordinary people who followed Jesus all over the countryside? They played their miserable little part too. Pilate, seeking the strength of public opinion, offered to release either Christ or Barabbas. He left it to the people. The decision was with them. Barabbas went free. Jesus died. Doesn't that remind you of politicians in every age? See which way the wind is blowing? That day the multitude cried, Crucify Him! Where were the ordinary people then? Where were those who spread branches in His way and shouted His praises just a few short days before? Some were at work, perhaps. Others were at play. Probably, they thought, the others would be there to shout for Jesus. Perhaps they didn't realize how serious this trouble really was. They felt sure that Jesus would work His way out of this thing somehow. It wasn't their business anyway. They probably reasoned that way. Who were they to decide such matters? They were too busy making a living. Let Brother Scribe and Mr. Priest decide such matters. There were some who were there that day. 
Some were caught in the madness of the mob spirit and went over to Christ's enemies. They added their noises to the swelling chant of crucify him. It was what everybody was saying. So it must be right. There were probably a few who raised their voices for Jesus, but such a very few that their feeble, timid cry was drowned out and lost in the reverberating chorus of hatred roaring all about them. It is even so today. The ordinary people, like you and me, could in many instances swing the balance for the kingdom of God. The final decision is often in our hands, as it was in their hands that day when they cried, Crucify Him. And so, what have we done about it? What are we doing? What do we resolve to do? Is there blood on our hands? Is there the sound of hammering in our lives as the nails go home to crucify the cause of the crucified Lord? And you know, my question is, why didn't they know? Why didn't these people know? Paul said, if they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. I want to read from John chapter 6, verses 37 through the end of the chapter, verse 47, or verse 39 through the end of the chapter, 47. And this is an inner uh, view that Christ had with some of these scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders. And he said to them, You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they that testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you might have life. I do not receive honor from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. But if another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? You know, there were a lot of things that these people had. They, first of all, many of them thought of highly of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist had pointed to Jesus. They had witnessed the miracles, even people raised from the dead. And then they had the Scriptures that Jesus constantly and others were showing that He was the Christ. So, how is it they could not know? And I think it's captured in verse 44. How can you who believe, or how can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? They were caught up in their own things, in their own life, in their own way of, of going and Receiving honor from one another rather than the honor that comes from the only God. So this was the first verse in the question, you know, who was it that crucified the Lord? How could it be that they did not know? And then in verse tw uh, 9 we read, However it is written, No eye has seen, nor has ear heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. C.S. Lewis wrote a sermon that he delivered back in 1942 entitled, The Weight of Glory. And in this, Lewis tries to weave the strongest spell that he can to wake us up from the evil enchantment of worldliness. Thanks to our educational systems and modern philosophies, 
because we walk every day on the razor edge between two incredible possibilities. One, to be known, appreciated, and delighted in by God, Christian glory. Well done, thou good and faithful servant, Matthew 25 and 21. Or, two, to be forgotten, shamed, and dismissed by God. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work iniquity, Matthew 7 and verse 23. To begin weaving this spell, Lewis appeals to desire. We have a deep desire to be acknowledged in this universe, and nothing seems to satisfy this innate desire. I remember a book I read years ago entitled, you know, The Search for Significance. Really deep down, we all want to be significant in some way. And so Lewis boldly suggests, with the support of the Gospels, that our desires are in fact far too weak because we are content with the vanities of this world while infinite glory in heaven is being offered to us. By exploring the puzzling and repellent ideas of Christianity, Lewis concludes that Christian glory, to be delighted in by God, is the only match for our deepest desire and becomes not only a weight of glory that we must bear in our daily lives because of the possibility of incomprehensible happiness for ourselves, but also a call to carry the weight of our neighbor's glory every day, in whom Christ, glory Himself, is truly hidden. And so a few quotes from this sermon, The Weight of Glory. Indeed, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling around with drink and sex and ambition. But remember your fairy tales. Spells are used for breaking enchantments as well as for inducing them. And you and I have need of the strongest spell that can be found to wake us from the evil enchantment of worldliness which has been laid upon us for nearly a hundred years. If our religion is something objective, then we must never avert our eyes from those elements in it which seem puzzling or repellent. For it will be precisely the puzzling or the repellent which conceals what we do not yet know and need to know. Now, if we are made for heaven, the desire for our proper place will be already in us, but not yet attached to the true object and will even appear as the rival of that object. And this, I think, is just what we find. No doubt there is one point in which my analogy of the schoolboy breaks down. The English poetry which he reads when he ought to be doing Greek exercises may be just as good as the Greek poetry to which the exercises are leading him, so that in fixing on Milton instead of journeying on to Aeschylus, his desire is not embracing a false object. But our case is very different. If a transtemporal, transfinite good is our real destiny, then any other good on which our desire fixes must be in some degree fallacious, must bear at best only a symbolical relation to what will truly satisfy. And of course, what the illustration of the schoolboy that he's referring back to here just before this paragraph, he talked about these schoolboys who, were, who loved Milton's poetry and they were reading that and they didn't want to do their Greek grammar. <laughs> you know, they laid that aside because they were exulting in these poems but he said that that Greek was the very thing that would lead them even to more great poetry in Greek. And so that was the analogy that he was drawing there. In the end, that face, which is the delight or the terror of the universe, must be turned upon each of us 
either with one expression or with the other, either conferring glory inexpressible or inflicting shame that can never be cured or disguised. And I think of another writing of Lewis that is not in this weight of glory but fits what he's saying here. In the end, God, we will either say, thy will be done, or my will be done. And God will let us make that choice. And so this face that will look at us will either confer glory or an inflicting shame. The promise of glory is the promise almost incredible and only possible with the work of Christ that some of us, that any of us who really chooses, shall actually survive that examination, shall find approval, shall please God, to please God, to be a real ingredient in the divine happiness, to be loved by God, not merely pitied, but delighted in as an artist delights in his work or as a father and a son. It seems impossible. A weight or a burden of glory which our thoughts can hardly sustain. But so it is. Glory, as Christianity teaches me to hope for it, turns out to satisfy my original desire and indeed to reveal an element in that desire which I had not noticed by ceasing for a moment to consider my own wants, I have begun to learn better what I really wanted. Nature is mortal. We shall outlive her. When all the suns and nebulae have passed away, each one of you will still be alive. Nature is only the image, the symbol. But it is a symbol Scripture invites me to use. We are summoned to pass in through nature, beyond her, into that splendor which she fitfully reflects. It may be possible for each to think too much of his own potential glory hereafter. It is hardly possible for him to think too often or too deeply about that of his neighbor. The load or weight or burden of my neighbor's glory should be laid daily on my back, a load so heavy that only humility can carry it, and the backs of the proud will be broken. Next to that blessed sacrament itself, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. If he is your Christian neighbor, he is holy in almost the same way. For in him also, Christ very latita, the glorifier and the glorified, glory himself is truly hidden. And that Latin phrase just means to be something that is hidden inside. And so Christ is hidden inside even your neighbor, that's what he's trying to get us to see. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilization, these are mortal, and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, exploit. Immortal horrors are everlasting splendors. For glory meant good report with God, acceptance by God, response, acknowledgement, and welcome into the heart of things. The door on which we have been knocking all our lives will open at last. And so someone may be sitting out there saying, well, okay, any Rose, C.S. Lewis, whoo, great, they're good writers and all that, but what's this all about? The point is that God has placed heaven in our hearts. Paul said it this way there in 2 Corinthians. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love Him. Look to the person sitting next to you, down the bench from you. Look at your children. Look at the stranger. Every one of them are destined 
are meant to be destined for glory. To be a part, as Lewis uses in some of his writing, of the great dance, you know. The, the way the Scripture defines it sometimes is the big feast. You've been vi invited to the dinner. You're going to be an honored guest. God has placed heaven in our hearts. In Hebrews 11 and verse 6, we read of the great heroes of faith. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to call their God, for He has prepared a city for them. I know Lewis wrote sometimes, he talked about joy and that it just occurred occasionally. But have you ever been, and it may be somewhere in nature, it may have been something else, but it seems like you have this great feeling well up inside you. You know, I've had that when I stand on the rim of the Grand Canyon and look down in that canyon and just, it's like glory. God's creation. And He means for all of us to be a part of it. And so, God has prepared something for us. Not here, but a heavenly home. But what happens is that we come under the spell of the world and what it offers. And you know what? The devil offered Jesus the very same thing. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan. For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Matthew 4, 8-10. through 10. You know, we want it all. <laughs> we want prestige. We want money. We want power. We want, you know, the latest gadget. We want it all. The devil offered it all to Jesus. He said, this, I'll give it all to you. Just fall down and worship me. And so, the world tempts us. It does. It tempts us with the very same temptation, Jesus. And how are we going to answer it? I think the only way we'll ever answer it successfully is with the Word of God, as Jesus did. That's how He answered it. As Lewis points out so eloquently and powerfully in The Weight of Glory, we are selling out for an inferior and temporary prize. I think of the question Jesus asked. How much will a man give in exchange for his soul? And I think of the rich farmer who had bumper crops and he said, I'm going to build myself bigger barns. And He sold out for security that night <laughs> because he thought, I have many goods laid up for a long time, just eat and drink and Thou fool, this night your soul will be required of you, and whose will these things be that thou hast provided? So are they that are not rich toward God. He wasn't condemned for being rich. He wasn't condemned for building bigger barns. He was condemned because he sold out for something temporary. He was not rich toward God. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. And so what I hope is happening today, I hope, and my point in in bringing this particular lesson is to wake us up. God has made everything beautiful in its time. He has put eternity in man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. We can be so easily led astray, off track. We don't understand why do good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people? And then we start questioning God and wondering, where is God? Why doesn't God do something? 
And yet in every one of us, God has placed eternity in our hearts. And he has said that eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Glory. Glory be to God that he would provide such a blessing for us. My friend, wake up. Don't be led astray by the temporary. Don't allow the fog of this world to dim the splendor that God has prepared for those that love Him. And, you know, we can pat one another on the back like the Pharisees, like we read there in John 6. We can do all those kinds of things, but the approval that we really need and that we really want and that desire that God has placed within each of us will only truly be satisfied in him and so I pray that you will be able to see that truth clearly if your gospel subject one week assist today we invite you to come while we sing <laughs> I know my heart today. Try me, O oh Savior. Know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin. And set me free. I praise the Lord for cleansing me from sin. Fulfill thy word and make me pure within.
from Matthew chapter 16. Mark 16, starting verse 1. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices, that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb where the sun had risen. And they said, and they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in long white robes sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. Happy Easter. Easter is the day that we as Christians set aside to remember the day that Jesus Christ had victory over death. Easter is a day that we set aside to remember his resurrection. And what a great time of the year to do it. It's in the spring. Everything is green. Everything is new. Everything is pretty. It's a new beginning. And we set this time aside just to remember these things. And I'm glad we do. But you know what else we're told? We're also told to do this up on the first day of every week. We're told to come around this table and to partake of this bread and partake of this fruit of the vine that represents his shed blood and that represents to us his victory over death every Sunday and to renew our faith every Sunday and our hope that we have through Jesus Christ, our Savior. That that day when he died, he took our sins with him. And what he asks of us is upon the first day of every, day, of every week, come and remember that sacrifice. Not just Easter, not just Christmas. It's great that we do these things. It's great that we focus a day solely for this. But we need to remember that each and every Sunday, we should be right here doing this very same thing. So this morning as we come around this table, let's, let's remember that sacrifice. Let's remember the, how great it is that when he died, he took our sins from us. And when he was resurrected, he showed us that we have hope of eternal life after death. So this morning we do have the bread that represents his body. We have the fruit of the vine that represents Christ's shed blood. And we'll give thanks for the bread. Father, we come before you this morning to thank you for every blessing of life. But Father, we especially thank you for the plan of salvation that you have put before us to 
Give us hope of eternal life. Father, at this time we pray that as we partake of this bread, that we all may partake of it in a way that is well-pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Dear Lord, thank you for this fruit of the vine, which represents to us who shed blood on the cross. Help us to take it in a worthy manner. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
concludes the Lord's Supper. We do take this time now to give back part of what we've been blessed with. We've been blessed with so many uh, comforts and conveniences and just an abundance of everything. So at this time, we give back part of what we've been blessed with so that we might continue the work of the church. Blake, would you give thanks? Dear Lord, again, we thank you for this day that you've given us, and we thank you uh, especially for this day that we celebrate the resurrection of your son that died on the cross to save us from our sins, Lord, and we just uh, pray that you would uh, bless this uh, tithing in a way that is pleasing unto you. May we give in a way that is pleasing unto you, and uh, may it go to further, further and spread your word and work. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Very good lesson, Scott. Uh, we have a few announcements to make th this morning. Um, first of all, Glenna Joyce, uh, she is doing better now, and she wanted to thank all of our congregation for the prayers and thoughts. Um, Deanne's aunt, Betty Dutton, uh, she's going through some health issues, and uh, as well as Ann Barnes, so we need to remember those two. Uh, uh, so, uh, Barbara, what's their last name? Lewis. Lewis. Barbara Lewis. Uh, she is. Do, she's doing better, and Claudia Lewis might be able to go home Thursday, but she still has a long road of recovery and rehab. So, need to remember both of those and pray for them. Uh, Thomas was released from rehab last week. Uh, so, thank you for the the prayers and the thoughts and continue to remember him. Kendra Turby, Turbyfield was admitted to the hospital for a brain bleed. I believe she's doing better as well, but I think she's still in the hospital. So continue to pray for her. And C Carolyn Fondren has been released from the hospital and is in a rehab facility now, uh, trying to regain some of that strength. Uh, so continue to remember her in your prayers. Uh, feed the pig back there, any loose change you have, feed the pig, and um, also if you feel the need to donate to the people of Ukraine, there's National Christian Foundation paperwork back there, you can fill those out. Uh, those are all the announcements that I have, is there anything else that needs to be added? Okay. So there's two different funds that you can donate to. Um, if it, I might just mention that Bobby Moore, who's vice president of Christian Relief Fund, has just returned from the Ukraine and Romania and a lot of those countries around there. He was actually in the Ukraine and uh, uh, they're helping a lot of the refugees. The Christian Relief Fund is they uh, providing food and toiletries and other things that they're needing and helping to get them into. Uh, some kind of housing, so he was over there for a couple of weeks doing that work uh, in, in the Ukraine and Romania and other countries around. That's good to hear, and good to hear that he made it back safely. If nothing else, um, Steve, we go ahead and lead us in our closing prayer. Come together to work with you. Pray, Heavenly Father, that your 
super proud and straight. And then I knew you're over here for a short time. If these things soon vanish away, and then you'll meet you face to face. Help us to keep this in mind in the state that we live, and may it draw us closer to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.